Okay, so hi everyone, and welcome to this uh, to this panel entitled "Sustainable Future Through Advanced Materials." My name is uh, Eduardo Troche, and I'm the head of the Technology Transfer and Innovation Office of the Intea Materials Institute. And if this, in the name I, India doesn't resonate, uh, it groups seven different institutes in the region of Madrid. We are all spread uh, the region, work in different fields in water, nanoscience, energy materials, food, software, and networks, and we are supported by the, by the regional government of Madrid. Uh, between all the seven institutes, we gather more than 800 researchers, 50% of them from outside of Spain, and we have uh, been granted 14 ERC grants and 10 EIC grants, which are the most disruptive ones you can get in Europe. Uh, now, one thing that we are really proud of what, how we do science in, in India is the fact that we apply fundamental knowledge to tangible problems. So if you're young like me, you have never seen as tangible problems as in the past three years. And that's even leaving the pandemic aside. The uh, climatic change has brought a paradigmatic change in, uh, in the energetic system that affects how we power our houses, our cars, and our cities. We have a lot of uh, devices and technologies that are vital today and that use materials uh, that are quite scarce. And there are even, another, there are even another problems that don't get as much, as much space as uh, they should in the news, but that even endanger our own survival and the survival of other species, like the pollution of water in, in the water of our oceans and, and seas. So my goal here today is that you leave this panel with a more optimistic vision because uh, society is asking for short-term solutions or mid-term solutions from science and technology to solve these challenges. And I have here the, the pleasure of uh, having uh, four scientists from, mm, from uh, these institutes uh, that are going to, to talk about how, what are they doing in their labs to, to tackle all these problems. So I'd like to introduce you to, uh, well, it's better if you introduce yourself, please. Okay. Well, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, a pl real pleasure to be here, part of this uh, wonderful event. My name is uh, Abraham Esteve. I'm, I'm a researcher at India Water, which is uh, an institute fully devoted to the develop water technologies and to understand the, the water as a challenge and, and, and trying to explore different approaches in order to solve uh, real problems that we are all having as citizens not just citizens, but also industries. And uh, during the last uh, 10 years, we have been developing a number of applications in order to solve real problems related to, to water pollution. I'm, I'm pretty sure that when you are uh, listening about water pollution, most of you are always thinking about industries, okay, companies, and that kind of things, oil and gas. But uh, this is not necessarily true. I mean, we are uh, also responsible and we are actors of this pollution every single day, when, not just when we go to the, to the toilet, but when we are having a shower and we are getting rid of a lot of chemicals that we uh, uh, took the, the day before, some primary products that we are using, okay? Uh, like for making up or for uh, just uh, um, uh, pills and drugs. So little by little, we are also uh, polluting our waters, okay? And these waters are gonna be discharged uh, later on in the environment. So we are focused on developing application which uh, have to be sustainable, that uh, have to be low OPEX, low energy consumption, in order to, uh, let's say, um, accelerate the market uptake of our new ideas. Uh, this was uh, the challenge that we started a few years ago, and we decided that probably a good idea to accelerate this uh, transfer technology of our idea was the founding of spin-off companies. So I am here like a, I'm a researcher, but i also an entrepreneur. So I'm also a, a businessman, which is not very common in research uh, academic world. And I'm trying to, you know, uh, to push a little bit the transfer technology so uh, finally we can get some ideas out in the market. Regarding uh, to probably our most innovative uh, concepts are the use of uh, electroactive bacteria, which are some kind of uh, living cell bacteria, which are able to uh, communicate 
uh, transferring electrons with uh, electroconductive materials. And this is uh, probably the first place where the word material is appearing in this talk. And it is key for us. I mean, we are focused on uh, accelerating the, the activity of the bacteria for removing the pollutants. And this is just taking place when you are using the proper materials. And those electroconducting materials are, uh, are not fully available in the, in the market. Okay? They are a specific material that we are developing in order to play a nice role as support of this electroactive bacteria. So they could uh, uh, really enhance the biodegradation rate, which basically means the rate that the bacteria are eating the pollution. So finally, we could have a, a very uh, active uh, device, a very active system that could uh, be used for decentralized wastewater treatment. So basically, we have been able to develop a method for treating wastewater at single housing, in a building, in a small community, in a small condominium, uh, absolutely isolated from the standard sewage uh, treatment. Which kind of material we are using? We are uh, always looking for sustainable material based on carbon, still uh, keeping the electroconductive properties, but at the same time being sustainable. So we are using food waste, trying to give a, a circular economy approach to solve our problem. We are able to take uh, one piece of wood, which is typically uh, used as waste, and af after a pyrolysis uh, procedure, we are able to make this wood electroconductivity. So we can, we can make this uh, material uh, electroconductive, so the bacteria could really use it as a support, and we can increase and enhance the uh, treatment of the process by, by 10 times. And this is probably our, our best uh, um, scenario in order to play with living cells, bacteria in this case, and new material which uh, are not in the market. That's amazing. It's an outstanding way of taking advantage of the interactions and synergies between living organisms and materials. And on the material side, it intersects a lot with the expertise of uh, Juan Jose, Juan Jose uh, who is a, a, a world expert in, in making carbon nanotubes in a sustainable way. And, and you have expanded your way of making nanotubes to, to other materials. Please tell us about it. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you bring up the topic of carbon nanotubes. So I would, I would be prepared to bet that about 20 of you in the audience are carrying carbon nanotubes right now. Because carbon nanotubes are in pretty much every battery in a mobile phone. Now, that's OK. But the question is, well, can we do something better with them? And with other nanomaterials, of course, just how, just how they've been widespread to electronics, can we tackle some challenges uh, to do with the environment? And of course, the answer is yes. Um, and this is happening on a very large scale. The production in, in today, uh, today of, of these nanocarbons is about 2,000 tons per year. Right? All that is going into lithium-ion batteries. And what's really important about that introduction in batteries is that it will probably it will increase the range of electric vehicles and therefore improve their adoption. I estimate that roughly the range will, it will increase by 50% just by introducing nanocarbons. Um, but that has taken 30 years, roughly. So it's a long time. How do, and the question I, when I wake up in the morning and I go to the lab, I think, how can we accelerate the development of science and technology so that we can use nanomaterials, which is my specialty, and develop the new generation of conductors, electrodes, and structural materials, something that can have an impact. And um, so what we are working on is, is nanotextiles for various reasons. We like nanotextiles because it is a format that can bridge scales. Nanomaterials are not really, uh, they are raw materials. They are like polymers, powders, plastics, stuff that needs to be transformed into a finished product. So what we have developed is a method to make nanotextiles and therefore, that's the way to integrate them into mainstream applications, for instance, membranes, electrodes, and so on. Now, we realize that new technologies need to be sustainable. And the breakthrough we've had was in, in enabling this manufacturing route while eliminating all solvents. So we see this as, as something that has 
that will unlock the potential of, of nanomaterials, uh, irrespective of their chemistry. So this is a transformation process. To give you an analogy, in the 20th century, of course, we already had polymers. We had plastics, right? But then first they were used for toys and things like that. And the same polymers are now used today for, uh, to make the best windmills, the best aircraft, uh, the best uh, ballistic shields, and so on. So really high-tech applications. And it's the same chemistry. It's just the way we transform it. So what we think we are in the process of doing at Timdea Materials, and of course the broader community, is in enabling this transformation of raw nanomaterials into high-performance products. Uh, and I have no doubt that that will transform uh, the way we apply them to, of course, uh, applications to do with energy management, but also to develop smart skins and metamaterials for electromagnetic interference and, and applications that are really beyond what we can conceive uh, in the next five years. Um, so if I had to give you uh, a couple of examples that are particularly important for sustainability, I would choose three. The first one is the possibility to make electrodes for batteries. If we can avoid solvents in the manufacture of electrodes, which is what we're pursuing uh, in a spin-off company at Imda Materials, I estimate that we can eliminate roughly about 50 kilograms of CO2 emissions per kilowatt hour of battery. So if that number means absolutely nothing to you, I'll say that it's roughly preventing the emission of two tons of CO2 for a normal electric vehicle, right? If you look at the targets for the Spanish government which, uh, for 2030, it means that we can save about uh, 10 million, emission of 10 million tons of CO2. The second initiative of interest is to do with producing nanocarbons as a byproduct in the generation of hydrogen. So we're trying to work with industry, including oil and gas, so that this is applied on the gigaton scale, which is the scale one needs to reach to really move the needle. Uh, and the third one is the main concern I have, which is about recycling. And, and again, nanotextiles offer the possibility to recycle infrastructure. And I am, this is important for this country because one of our biggest assets are, is wind power and photovoltaics. And both need urgent solutions for recycling. We're talking again on the scale of hundreds of thousands of tons of materials that we need to recycle. Um, so I'd love to talk more about this, but I suspect I have taken too much. Uh, so I'll let others also uh, contribute. Well, that's, that's great. And, uh, and I'm glad you mentioned the, the interaction between materials and energy, because that's precisely the, the expertise of, uh, of Marta. And Marta, I know that in your lab you're working on a very disruptive concept, which is artificial photosynthesis, and you're using it to, to manufacture new materials. So tell us about it. How, cl how close are we to, to see it transfer to, to our reality? OK, thank you so much, Eduardo, for your kind introduction. As you say, I am working in, in the energy. As the name say, uh, our main topic is the energy in general. Uh, but in your unit, in your, our research unit, we are focusing in, in those kind of photoactivated process that can be uh, agrouped in photo, artificial photosynthesis process. I mean, we want to, to mimic the nature, okay, developing new materials, able to, to transform CO2 uh, as raw material and water or even nitrogen into solar fuels, okay? To do so, we have to, to make a very intense effort in the development of new hybrid material in general. We, we, we make sure of, we, 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 we use the, both inorganic uh, semiconductor and also uh, organic ones, in general polymers, the polymers are at the end, plastic as my colleagues say, okay? But we are uh, speaking about the, the, the more technological ones, okay? The more sophisticated one, okay? In order to, to be able to produce uh, hydrogen, uh, produce C zinc gas, CO2 or and hydrogen mixture, or even uh, ammonia or urea, okay? That can be used as uh, fuels in the new en engineers, okay? and using the pollutants of the atmosphere, okay? 
Um, to do so, uh, we have to, to, to develop uh, new forms to, to process the materials, as, as, as um, uh, Juan Jose said. It's really important to, to be able to process uh, these materials, and in this, in this uh, sense, we have developed a new uh, bottom-up approach to prepare nanoparticles of uh, this kind of polymers, these sophisticated polymers, okay, in order to be able to prepare thin films that are useful for uh, photoelectrochemical devices, are necessary to, 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 to prepare these photoelectrochemical devices. Uh, as this kind of material are uh, very, we have a very large uh, manner to do uh, changing the building blocks, we have uh, able to prepare a um, very large amount of uh, several materials, and in this sense, we are preparing this in this moment a uh, uh, mm, robotic and a robotic platform in order to uh, be able to prepare this 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 kind of uh, materials as thin films, and uh, to have enough uh, um, enough. Uh, um, um, uh, data to prepare uh, a machine learning approach, okay, in order to have a lot of inputs, okay, with this kind of material and at the end uh, get the, the best one to our, uh, uh, to our uh, goal, okay, in, the, in, this, in, this, uh, in this sense to, to be able to produce the most uh, amount of hydrogen or most amount of solar fuels, okay. That's a really interesting point and I don't know if you attended the, the previous panel, uh, but there was one speaker from, from Amazon that uh, talking about uh, quantum computing and artificial intelligence. He said that he expects that the, mo the greatest impact of quantum computing at the, in the short term will be in material science. So we can get to, 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 that, to that point later, but I would like to also to, to ask Alberto, because uh, Alberto works in a kind of a different field, but very interesting one, uh, rare earths. So we don't have rare earths in, in Europe, and they are critical for many uh, energy applications, like, well, in the engines are fire cars, wind, engine, wind uh, turbines. Uh, so Alberto, how are you, uh, you're tackling this from a very uh, particular way. Uh, please tell us, uh, tell us about it. Thank you, Eduardo. My name is Alberto Boyero, and I am working at Indea Nanoscience. So what we try to do is as Eduardo was mentioning, you know, to bring nanoscience into applications. We do basic science, but we do also basic science that then at the end is finishing in applications. And one of them is this topic of critical raw materials. So the European Union has a huge challenge now, especially after the conflict between Ukraine and Russia, on how achieving the objectives of the Green Deal with materials that we are not producing in Europe. So as Eduardo mentioned before, we need rare airs. So what are rare airs? Where are they? Well, actually, Ursula von der Leyen, the European Commission president, uh, she was mentioning in September that rare airs will be the next oil and, f and gas. So we will have the same problem if we do not solve this problem of getting the resources, of trying to produce materials in Europe. So as for rare airs, 98% of rare earths are coming from China. Where do we need rare earths? So to give you an example, in your car, you have about one kilogram of rare earths in the magnets of your motor. That you may think that is a big number, but when you think on a wind turbine, you have up to two tons of rare earths in each aerogenerator in the motor about two tons of rare earths in the permanent magnets that are there. So what we are working on different projects, and one of them is Passenger Project, it's a European project with 20 partners, and from those 20 partners there are 13 companies that are fully committed to have eight pilot plants to produce permanent magnets without rare earths by 2025, and also to do the integration in electromobility. So the message is how is possible to combine the scientific and technological development, combining also the effort from research centers, as in DEAS, as you see here, with the interest on companies to achieve a sustainable solution that can be translated to electromobility, but also to energy. So that is 
extremely important, but also considering recycling. So basically, it's, it's to provide an integral solution. So it's not only to generate, to create new materials, but also to focus on the recycling. Just to give you an idea, I told you before this strong dependency that we have on critical materials to prepare these permanent magnets. We get 98% from China. But then when your products, your mobile phone, your laptop, the motors, at the end of life of those products, still we are sending these motors, these magnets, to China for recycling, and we buy once again the material. So we are recycling in Europe less than 1% of these permanent magnets that contain rare earths. So it's still crazy what we are doing. So what we are doing research at Indian Nanoscience is to provide also recycling methods, but also that involves digital transformation. Because if you ask to many colleagues that are working on recycling, they will tell you, I know how to recycle this, but please put it on the table and then I will be able to recycle it. How to collect the materials, how to collect the products to apply recycling. So it's very important traceability and also digitalization of the processes. And for that, we are also working together with other centers. We are starting also a new European project in January to try to provide this traceability and to make efficient all these processes. So at the end, is, I think, I think the, mes the, the main message is diversification and recycling, but a wise diversification to make research and to implement new materials, but for a specific technologies, basically to distinguish between science and science fiction. That is different. Okay? So to make a wise approach of how you want your technology to be implemented in an efficient way, not to create more trouble. It's not, it's not the scope to put more materials on the market, but materials, functional materials that really will work on a specific applications, because not every material in terms of, for example, permanent magnets, not every permanent magnet we are going to design, every material is going to work everywhere. Maybe a permanent magnet material will work, as it is the case, for an electric motorbike or an electric scooter. But that material will not be work in the driving motor of a car. But for that, we will have another material. So the idea is to find this sustainability in Europe to generate job, to generate rich, okay? but also to, to generate and to contribute with the knowledge that we have in Europe. That's great, and I, I, I'm glad that you, that you point out the need of well, the, the market, the need to have more industry, even recycling also in, in the manufacturing side. And in order to do that, we need the whole ecosystem to work together. We need policies, we need investment, we need more training for people to have scientists with a better entrepreneurship mindset. And in order to, I mean, you have a trajectory already, you have a spin out a company, you too. Uh, Alberto, you are having a different approach in taking your, your science to your partners. And Marta, I know you are thinking in your lab also to, on the possibility of, of a spin-off. So how do you see the evolution of the ecosystem in the past years? Are we advancing at the pace that we need? Or what do you think? Um, I don't think we are advancing at the pace we should be uh, moving. Uh, nevertheless, I am optimistic, despite these very worrying challenges ahead. Uh, I feel, as a foreigner, that uh, we're in a great place to, to tackle these challenges. I see a country where there are gigafactories being built, serious projects being built in the south. I see that uh, fusion reactors will be developed in, in Andalusia. I see that uh, this region of Catalonia is clearly a, a hub for, for photonics. I see, of course, that uh, Madrid has become a cluster for you know, attracting uh, scientists and, and, and students from all over the world. So I, I sense that we, and I see that, uh, the, that industry is reinventing itself in this country. We see companies that were first making glass, and now they want to make batteries, and I'm sure you have similar experiences. So there is an energy in that direction. For me, the, one of the key ingredients that is necessary, and I think everyone will agree with me, is young people. So yeah. we are desperate for young people who are interested in these challenges and who want to work hard on them. Uh, and that is the key. As rare earths may be the, the, the oil of the future, well, young people are the gold of the future, I find. 
So um, that would be my, my analysis. That's great. And, and going back to artificial intelligence and, and quantum computing, uh, I, know, I don't know if in, in all your groups have been experiencing with uh, these approaches, but I, I know that in groups uh, close to you uh, they are. Uh, can you dig down on, 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 on the opinion of this uh, speaker that said that uh, artificial intelligence has a lot of impact in the future, in the short future, for developing uh, smarter materials quicker? In terms of the application of artificial intelligence or the future, yeah, I think it's going to be a very extremely important tool. Right? For example, in, in this new project I was mentioning on recycling, actually the main scope is not the recycling process itself, but to be able, by using artificial intelligence, to have this traceability along the whole value chain. Right? So, and without that, all the investment that is done on recycling, on, on development of sustainable uh, processes, it will not work out. So all this support and all this background and generation of knowledge that will come from artificial intelligence, I think it's extremely, extremely important. For us, it's exactly the same. It's, it's, it's a tool for us in order to, to, to be faster okay, in the, 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 in, in the discovery of new material, in the discovery of new application. Uh, I think that is going to be the, the, the future. Okay. That's great. And, and Pastel X is precisely that. It's, a, it's an event that uh, talks about the future, wants to discuss about the future. And as scientists, you have to apply your vision to, to the future, right? You have to uh, see what you want to uh, research and have impacting. So what is your vision for your fields in the next five, 10 years? Where do you think you will see uh, your fields in, in the well, in, in, in our case, it's, uh, and I, I have the feeling I'm living kind of a science fiction chapter because, uh, I mean, 20 years ago when I, uh, we were starting to, to play with this uh, uh, opportunity of having living cells and bacteria producing electricity, uh, we always were thinking on energy, right? So, mm -hmm. so probably if you invite me 20 years ago, we were invited about, wow, yeah, the, the potential of harvesting energy with bacteria with what's true. But now that after a couple of decades, uh, I see much more, um, let's say, relevance in the idea that you can interrogate the living cells through the electrical current and the electroconductive material, and you can harvest info from living cells 24 hours a day. So if we mix this with the artificial intelligence, it means that we can find hidden uh, patterns that are in nature using uh, a discipline that is very old, which is electrochemistry, is the idea of uh, you know producing electrical current with material. And suddenly we have bacteria, we have electroconductive materials, new materials, new nano nanomaterial, new compositions, and it's 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 amazing because those researchers coming from the material, they never thought that they could really interact with living cells mm -hmm. in in such an approach. So. The, the future, uh, the way I see, is uh, um, probably a colonization of all these concepts, not just in the environment, that's where we are, but in at clinic level, so at, in biomedicine. Mm -hmm. So probably those concepts are already taking place inside our body, in prosthesis, in uh, surgeries. So I see like a, like a science fiction uh, book in probably uh, just a, in a question of five, ten years. That's great. Alberto, what do you think? What do I think about, about the future it? in your field? The future in my field? Well, in my field, I think it's very promising. Actually, I think it was never as promising as it is now because there are so many challenges, and every challenge is an open door to new opportunities. And there was a change in something very important, which is industry coming to researchers now. That is something that in the past was something that it was really science fiction, you know? <laughs> we were behind the, the industry following them to try to convince that we could, we could do something for them, not only to solve present problems, but also to foresee what may be the issues coming in the future. But now industry is coming to researchers to find solutions and the future it's, it's so unclear with all the things that are happening, okay, in terms, I mentioned before, raw materials, 
what will be the, the geopolitical situation, that they want to be sure that they will be able of providing products or solutions to the customer, to the citizens in the future. So I think it's a fantastic future that we have now in front of us. Marta, what on your side? I am optimistic by myself, okay? I think that the future has to be a nice future, okay? I hope that the geopolitics, as my colleagues say, allow us to um, the progress that we need, okay? And in, in my, my point of view is that uh, the, the sun is a source that we have to get already, okay? And, and, and the photoactivated process are uh, in, in his born, okay? And there are a lot of things to do with uh, mixture different technologies as photocatalyst and electrocatalyst, okay? And, and of course, uh, biomimetic process, for instance, the bacteria can give us the, to us the, the selectivity that we, ne we need, okay? Mm. That the materials are not able to, 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 to give us, okay? And mixture all of these technologies, uh, are, we are going to be able to, to, to tackle some of these energetic problems that the, the world need <laughs> to solve, okay? I really like that we have our focuses, water, energy, materials, nanoscience, but then we're talking about how we can interact with bacteria, with living organisms, so we are kind of diversifying our uh, portfolio of, uh, of research, let's say. Okay. Juanjo, uh, I'll, I'll ask your, your turn. Uh, for me, the defining concept for the future will be that there will be no waste of any kind. So organic waste will be transformed into uh, conductors. Uh, we see a glimpse of that. Uh, critical materials will be, of course, recycled, recovered, and then reused. Uh, and we will experience that increasingly. And, and in addition to that, even energy will be recycled. So heat generated in processing will be, re will be used. So industry will be much more coupled so that uh, heat can be transferred. So the manufacturing processes and the flow of materials and energy will change dramatically. So we need to develop this vision of a whole system rather than just a, a, a single material or a single step of a process. But we need to be much more aware of where the energy and the materials flow in their use and how they come back. Uh, and that's where there will be a lot of opportunities. And of course, uh, bringing in artificial intelligence for traceability could be a huge addition because the amount of data uh, generated is probably beyond what we can handle. And sometimes the link uh, between these processes is not obvious uh, for us. Um, so the opportunities in reducing weight and, and moving uh, the shift to how we produce things and, and transform them rather than how we power them only. That's great. Thing. I, I think that uh, for the future researchers, uh, there are a lot of new expertises that are going to be merged into new disciplines. Uh, I don't know if you participate in, in educational programs. How do you see uh, this new regeneration of researchers that can get into your labs and apply these new methodologies based on artificial intelligence on uh, living organisms? Well, I see a, a, big, uh, a brilliant future for all that generation of people. And, and uh, they come with another uh, mentality because they, they have realized that uh, science is not anymore you know, the basic disciplines that they learned from the university, that now they, they have to be used to play with materials and energy and, and, and living cells and uh, artificial intelligence. So they are more open than ever probably to, you know, to learn all very different disciplines. So I think uh, in, that, uh, in that sense, research is, is going to drastically change in the approach we are discovering the things in the next year. I think so. Uh, <laughs> it's already so different from when I did my PhD, so uh, <laughs> I, can, I cannot wonder how, how it look, will, will, will look like in 10 years. Uh, so our time is over, and I wanted to thank you for uh, having lunch fast in order to, to attend the, the panel, I, I hope uh, we have managed to uh, give you a, a more optimistic overview. And I, I'm sure you, the, our researchers uh, welcome any uh, comment or conversation that they can have with you.
uh, later on uh, throughout Puzzle X. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.